How are we doing? Are we awake? We good? Hey, uh, I want to just uh, touch on the youth internship one more, thi- one more time. We can try to get my words out and my speech impediments away. Um, I cannot tell you the importance of the way that we invest in our youth, not only as a church, but even as parents. Um, I've, what I've discovered, I've got to be a youth pastor for many years and then uh, since lead pastoring. Uh, the church in our older generation, so for almost everyone in this room, you guys, your guys are the car, the vehicle, and the debit card. If you ever gone gas, you, you got to put your debit card in, um, and then that you, you, you purchase the gas, and then you're able to keep driving. Well, uh, our youth, our next generation, from our, our high schoolers, junior hires, to our kiddos, uh, to even Nancy, who's got one in the oven. Um, sorry, is that, yeah, we're good, okay. Uh, <laughs> is they're the fuel. They're the gasoline. And what I discovered yesterday, I, I've had to fill up my car four times this last week because it's been crazy. And I decided, and how many of you, when you see the check, the, the gas light, do you see it as a, how many of you see it as a warning? Get gas. How many of you see it as a challenge? Okay, I see it as a challenge. And so I like to get my gas at Costco because it's cheaper and it's cleaner and I know what I'm getting. And so I'm four cars, if you've ever gotten your gas at Costco, um, I was four cars before I get my turn to the pump. Um, and I run out of gas. Yeah. So um, at that moment, I'm glad I got the half ton. I don't have the half ton pickup. I've got the quarter ton. Uh, because I had to push my truck each, because you have to one, one car at a time. And so each time I have to get back out and like, <laughs> the guy behind me is losing it. He thinks this is the greatest thing in his life. He shouts out the window, goes, man, to cut a little close, didn't you? I'm like, oh, yeah. Put that back in my pocket. Um, man. But what I ended up doing is I had to push my car all the way up, and then I got up to there, and I had the first one, I'm like, oh, thank God I don't have to go around the other car. But I pushed my truck so far away from the pump that the other guy behind me couldn't get around me. And I'm like, <laughs> Uh, my poor decisions are affecting your day. Um, but that's a lot of times what happens in church is we are pushing a church without fuel because we have failed to invest in our youth. And we wonder why we're not seeing the effectiveness and why we're not seeing generations come to know Christ is because we have failed to put gas in our tank. And the youth in our church and in our community are the gas in our tank. We will be exhausted and tired from pushing this thing called the well if we don't invest in our youth. And so whether you're a parent, this is a seven-week internship. It's three days. It already includes youth group and Sunday. And so it is an incredible opportunity where they get to come. They get to serve. They get to be, uh, they get to be poured into. And they get an active role. My son is six. He's already asking, hey, when can I operate the camera for big service? Okay. Our students want to serve. We have to be the people that not only give them the permission, we have to give them the tools. And so I cannot tell you enough. If you have a 7th grader to 12th grader, get them in this internship. Get them to camp. If you've got a kid, uh, and we get them, we get them to, you, uh, to kids camp. Do whatever you can to not stand in the way of this next generation coming to know Christ. Sound good? Yes. Worship team can come up. We'll go ahead and finish. Uh, just because, like, wait a minute. <laughs> I just sat down. <laughs> Give me a break. Um, well, today we're starting a new series called Into the Ordinary. And I entitled this message, it's kind of cliche, but bitter or better. Bitter or better. And as we look at this, this understanding of this series, we're going to look through the book of Ruth. So you can go ahead and turn there. It's in the Old Testament, uh, the book of Ruth. And uh, one of the great things about the book of Ruth is you don't see an active role of God. You don't see, like we just went through Mark, where we have, you know, Jesus walked on water. We're like, all right, God is here. That's pretty extraordinary. In the story of Ruth, he's referred to. And it's kind of like the way that you and I live our lives. For the most part, I don't think we have any James Bond personalities that are secretly CIA or anything. Anybody? 
Either you're lying or I'm going to be dead very soon after because I'm not supposed to know that. Uh, we don't have these big blockbuster lives that we're always, there's always an adventure around the corner. There's always a damsel in distress or a manzel in distress. I don't know what you call that, man in distress. Um, but there's always something we've got to do. You know, the, talk, the clock is always ticking and we have to go, go, go in this super adventure. There's explosions and there's, there's deep romantic feelings and we think that our lives should look like the movies we watch. And then we, they aren't, and so we get bored. Or we look at, we, 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 we grab a hold of stories that we see on social media or on the news of God doing amazing things in distant lands or amazing things in celebrity status people. And we're like, wow, God is so good to them. And we're just sitting back and go, I sat through traffic for an hour. Didn't flip anyone off today. Winning. Good job. Wow, my kid woke me up again, 3 a.m. Had lunch and dinner. The same woman for 25 years. There she is. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. She's going, yep, she's still here. <laughs> and we can get bored. And we can start thinking of the, our ordinary lives and go, God, you're not doing anything in my life. Things are just normal, boring. They are what they are. Maybe you're you're, maybe you're perfectly content. I I love it. I love. I get to go do the same thing all every day, every week. I come to church every Sunday. I mow the lawn on Saturday. You know, we go we go to a fancy dinner at the Olive Garden on Fridays. Like you've got your routine and you're good. But what's amazing with that? We can never think for a moment, or allow ourselves to think for a moment, that because we live ordinary lives does not mean that God is not up to extraordinary things. We have to be very aware that we can venture into the ordinary and realize that we have a God who's very much a part of the intricate details of your life. And sometimes it's hard to, you know, we can all have, all have confession time, right? We're all in a booth. Uh, anyone else feel like God's not doing a whole lot sometimes? You're not going to be struck by lightning if you raise your hand. Anyone feel like God's not doing a whole lot? Okay, thank you. Now we got some honesty we can hear from the Lord. Um, but we, we don't realize that the greatest impact that you and I will have, the greatest impact that God has, is through the little things. It's through the things that we feel like he's never around or not doing what we expect him to do. Those are the moments he's doing exactly the things you're wanting him to do, but he's just doing it in a way that you didn't expect him to do it. And so when we understand that, when we look at our circumstances, we need to recognize that all of us, we can, none of you can control your circumstances. There, there, there's some things we can control, but there's some things you just can't. No matter how hard you try, you cannot control certain things. Yes, you can eat gluten-free, organic food, and like do everything you're supposed to do and still get hit by a truck. Can't control some of that. But it's in our circumstances that are, that are going to determine our character. And for these next few weeks, we're going to meet a group of ordinary people living in ordinary lives, having to go through ordinary things, and we're going to find that God does extraordinary things in the midst of those people and those places. Let me give you a little bit of a, of a, a look at Ruth. So if you haven't turned there already, Ruth has four chapters, and in this book of Ruth, uh, they're kind of structured all in the same way. We, we see a plan. We see some sort of divine providence. This is, the divine providence is simply that you can see that God cares and does things that are odd. Either sometimes that God does miracles, and sometimes God just does odd things. You're like, wow, that's, is that a coincidence or is that God? And most of the time we just go, I don't care. I'm just going with it. And what I want us to do is begin to open up our eyes to see, be able to see where God is moving in ordinary ways. Because what happens is then we get to rejoice. So go ahead and turn to Ruth chapter 1. We're going to start here. If you're listening to our podcast or if you're in the family room right now, if you're watching on YouTube, we're glad that you're here. Uh, So go ahead and turn to Ruth chapter 1. And it says, In the days when the judges ruled there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elmiak, and the name of his wife was Naomi. 
The names of his two sons were Malhan and Chilin. I like that. He's just chilling. I like that guy. They were Epaphrites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elmiak, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives, the wives of, the one of, of Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived, th- three, sorry, they lived there about ten years, and both Mahon and Chilin died, so that the women was, were left without her two sons and her husband. So that's a lot of kind of a setting, the setting of what happened, where they're at, what's going on. So first is in the days of Judges, before Israel had a king that you, we read in First and Second Samuel, God was their king. God ruled over Israel, and the way when conflict arose, he would, he would bring up uh, rulers called judges. And these judges were temporary rulers. They were never, they're never meant to be a king. They were servant of God, and they, they took care of business. And so there's a whole book called the book of Judges. And can I, if you want crazy stories that you don't want to read your children at bedtime, read the book of Judges. Like that's like, uh, there's like four rated R movies just in that book. And so uh, this happens kind of in that time. There was, there was no king of Israel except for God was recognized as king. They were a distinct uh, community, com- distinct nation amongst all the other nations. Now, this is, uh, the law had been given. They've settled in the promised land. Uh, and then we find out, you know, later on you, you keep reading, you know, Samuel is the last judge. And then he goes on to be um, he, then the first king of Saul and the second king is David. So it kind of gives you an idea of timing that happens in that. So they live in Bethlehem. Many of you have heard of Bethlehem because of your constant studies of Israel history um, or Christmas. So Bethlehem, uh, I'm going to try to do this opposite. So Bethlehem is on the uh, west side of the Dead Sea. And the Moab Moab is, if you go around, you go north around the Dead Sea, and you sell sell it here in the land of Moab. So that's where they moved to. So the whole family got, because there was famine in the land. So it's like everyone moving to Texas from California right now. And so they go, they leave. They come back and they complain about the high taxes and the gas prices and everything else. So they come here, they live in the land of Moab. They live there for about 10 years. Now, especially in Israel's history, names mean something. A lot of times, sometimes you got your name because of a favorite TV show that your parents had, or maybe it was an uncle, or maybe an aunt, or a grandparent. But names really, uh, when you were born, is they kind of looked at you and named you. And so you even see that with, uh, with Esau and Jacob. Uh, J- Esau was born, and he was hairy. So they called him Esau, which means hairy. <laughs> Very creative. Uh, talk about you are, you're given what you are. Uh, Jacob was called because it says he grasped the heel because he was grabbing Esau's heel. And he goes, oh, all right, Jacob, there we go. And so these names that we just read are important. Emiliac means my God is king. And maybe because he was crowning. I don't know why they, he got that awesome name. Oh, you're all mature adults. <laughs> so I have two doctors in the house looking at me. I've got to make sure I'm okay. No, three doctors. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. Um, the name Naomi means pleasantness. Come on, you know she was a good baby. You know what I mean? Like, that's that baby you're praying for. You're like, oh, there's no crying. There's no whining. She lets you sleep at night. She's, Naomi is pleasant. But then you have their children. Ma- Malan means sickly. And Chilin means pining. So these children were born, and they weren't exactly the healthiest. Maybe they were premature. Maybe they were, had a, a, maybe they're colic. Maybe there was some sort of sickness that the, as, as they were born, they can see they were, maybe were not the strongest individuals. To the point where they waited till the father died in order to get them wives. And so they're in Moab. The father dies. And now Naomi sets her two sons up. Talking about, you know, having your mom do everything for you. Um, sets them up so they can have wives. Because she needs someone to take care of her. Because her husband has passed, she's, uh, she's on in age, and so the only way for a woman, now a widowed woman, to be taken care of is by her children. But these kids aren't exactly uh, winning, winning marathons. 
And so the goal is, okay, get them married, and, and then they can take care of the family. Well, the problem is the two sons die. So now you have three single women, women in ancient Palestinian culture. They're, they're just, might as well just go into a corner and die. And so Naomi begins to see, see this plight that they have. And so let's keep going in verse 18. It says, whenever the, I'm sorry, well, uh, sorry, verse 6. Then she arose and the daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, so they're in country, for she had heard the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from that place where she, so we already begin to see is she begins to hear that God is doing something extraordinary somewhere else. So she starts pursuing that. So that she set out from that place where she was with her two daughters-in-law. They went on the way and returned to the land of Judah, so they came back. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead with me. The Lord grant you kindly as you have... uh, The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, they lifted up their voices, and they wept. So on the way, she's about to leave Moab. She says, she goes, okay, my daughter-in-laws, your husbands have passed. You're released. Go find new husbands. You're still young. You still can bear children. Go to these other places. Go find new husbands. I'm going to go back. Now, Naomi, now she's a single woman, older in age, going back to her people, there's not a whole lot. She's going to be living a life of poverty the rest of her life. That's what's destined to her. And so she says, go, and they begin to weep. And they said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. And they show both of their dedication. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Okay, that's just weird. <laughs> you know what she's saying, right? Do I have to explain that? She has to get pregnant again. The children raise up and then marry these, these daughters. She goes, no, you're not going to do that. That's weird. That's crazy. Don't do that. Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait until they are grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is, is exceedingly bitter to me. For your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone, against, gone out against me. They lift up their voices and wept again. Do you see what now Naomi is feeling? She goes, the Lord's anger is against me. His, I'm bitter because the Lord has come against me. She has taken my, my husband. She has taken my sons. Anyone else would feel that way? That, you know, we get, we get a ticket and we wonder, like, God's against you. No, he's not. You just need to calm down. Uh, like, we, we, we face different things in life. You don't get a promotion. You don't get, uh, you, you have friends that are, are, those relationships are breaking down, or we're not getting the provision that we think we should be getting, or we're not meeting the person we think we should be meeting, and we automatically, God must be so mad at me. And what happens, we begin to get bitter at God. And when we begin to get bitter at God, we begin to get bitter with people. And Naomi is beginning this experience and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, and Ruth clung to her. This is just a side note. So Orpah, she goes says in, in kissing, we're going to see that she's going she's to go ahead and move on. But Ruth is going to stay by Naomi's side. I'm kind of really glad it was Ruth, because that is a strange name, Orpah, to be. We will have a lot of people in our culture and society named Orpah. I just like Ruth better. I'm sorry, Ruth. Uh, I'm just glad your name isn't Orpah. Um, okay, good, good. You always wonder that, like, there's biblical names, like, you know, we, oh, it's from the Bible, but have you ever heard anyone named, like, hey, what's your name, Judas? It's from the Bible. <laughs> like, I'm a Shepherdsack. Really? All right, well, it's from the Bible. Okay, anyway. Um, so she has faced unimaginable tragedy. Ruth clings to her, and she says, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. She says, Ruth, go. Go. Get out of here. Like, go back to your people. But Ruth said this, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There 
will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts from you. This is covenant language. This is an oath. This is a promise that Ruth is now bonding herself to Naomi and saying, wherever you go, I'm going to go. You can't get rid of me. I'm committing my, my life to take care of you. So all of the ladies began praying for a daughter-in-law, just like Ruth. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. We're gonna, not really going to talk about her. We're going, to, we're going to focus still on Naomi. But let's keep reading. It says, so the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. So they went around the Dead Sea. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. The women said, is this Naomi? She said to him, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, which means pleasant, when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the country of Moab when they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So she says, don't even call me Naomi anymore. God has dealt with me so poorly. Call me Mara. I'm bitter, angry, I'm upset. Her identity has shifted because of her circumstances. And it's going to be Ruth who is going to help bring her back. But I love it as Naomi settles into this mental state of despair, of bitterness. This overwhelming feeling is such, it's a state of mind of loneliness as you begin to isolate yourself from other people because the more bitter you get, the more likely you are to distrust the people around you because they're just going to disappoint you too. After all, you're creating the image and likeness of God and he doesn't like me, so why would you like me? And and she begins to settle in this. But Ruth, she settles into a mental state of steadfastness. She binds herself to Naomi with no hope of provision, no hope of care, no no hope of anything. And so we see where both of them have faced terrible circumstances. They both have lost a husband. Naomi has lost her children. But the circumstances are going to begin to to reveal their character. So this is what I I want you to understand as we talk about bitterness. Now, bitterness, it, it makes your life tight and tense. It's living disappointed that, God, that God's, love must, God's love must be for everybody else. And we can be bitter about really big things, losing a husband, losing kids, or we can be really bitter about little things. Now, it could be at a person, it could be at God, but whatever it is, we struggle with bitterness. And we like to hold on to it. It becomes our pet. And we want to do everything we can to validate that bitterness that we're feeling inside. Also, when we face those those, those circumstances, we can also become better. We can open up as a person. We can be filled with God's love and receive it. We can overflow this beautiful fruits of love and faith and hope for other people. We can say, yeah, that, that sucks, but you know what? I can help someone else. There's two different places that we can do. And this is where I want us to explore. When we face these circumstances, are you going to become bitter or are you going to become better? In Ephesians 4, it says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. In Hebrews 12, 15, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, let that no root of bitterness bring up, causes trouble, and it may be defiled. And that's what bitterness does. It begins, it finds a root in your heart, finds a root in your mind, and begins to start overshadowing and taking over of the things in your life. I don't know if you've ever, you know, if you ever try to take care of your lawn or your planter, that you get these little weeds in there, and they just, like, start taking over. And the really, the really bad ones are the ones that get, like, thorny. And they don't just, like, spread. They, like, grab the other plants. So you can literally see them strangle them. That's what bitterness does to our heart. That's what bitterness does to our minds. what bitterness does to the way that we view people, the way we view God. And it's very hard to trust God when you think he's just out to get you. It's very hard to trust your spouse when you think they're just out to get you. It's hard to trust and gain friendships when you think they're just going to try to take advantage of you.
So I want to just bring to you three points of application that we can overcome a life of bitterness. Because when life is bitter, it's bitter. And everyone sees it on you, and you feel it, they feel it, and it's not the greatest thing in the world. How do you want to live better lives? Just asking. Anyone want to live a better life? Anyone want to let go of the bitterness that they're holding on to? I do. This was one of the most frustrating messages I've had to do because it goes, it was just like every time it was like, here, 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 here. I'm like, okay, can we just talk about Ruth being good? Do we have to talk about Naomi and her bitterness? And I feel, and I just, as we studied, and as I studied, it's just like, no, because I, even if it's just for me, it's worth it for me. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of us in here are struggling with bitterness. So number one is hold on to truth. Hold on to truth. There are circumstances and people that are good, right? Yeah. yeah. But we also know there are circumstances that are bad, and people that are bad and unhealthy and destructive. That, that we're aware of that. But what we can hold on to is that God is always good. God is always healthy. And so when we face these different things, we are going to be given decisions at every moment if we're going to hold on to the unhealthy things or the healthy things. Are we going to continue to digest poison or are we going to give us something that's going to detox our bodies? And so we have to hold on to this truth that God is always good. You know what the great thing is? And this, is, this may be freeing to some and this may be like duh to, to others. But this is a really important part and I need everyone to pay attention to this part. Okay? God is not punishing you. God is not punishing you for the sin that you're in now. God is not punishing you for the things you did before. God is not punishing you for the things you're going to do. God is not punishing you. And this is why I know this. Because all punishment went on Jesus who hung on the cross. Not just the big ones. All of it. God saw everything that you did, are doing, and are going to do and put it on his son Jesus so that we don't have to bear that burden. That we don't have to worry that God is mad at us, angry at us, or disappointed in us. That we can run to our Heavenly Father and receive his grace and his freedom because he came not to condemn the world, but to set it free. So we have to get out of our head. If you're going through a difficult situation, it's not because God is mad at you. But the beautiful thing is God doesn't waste anything either. So when you are going through stuff, some of it's a result of natural sin, some of it's a result of your just the consequences of some of your decisions, there are things, but always know that God is not mad at you and punishing you, but he's going to take the things that you're going through and he's going to use them to purify you. He's going to use them to build your character. But it's only, the only difference is if you're going to be bitter, it's going to destroy you. But if you're going to be better, it's going to start building you up. We have to be aware of what truth is. And that's where God turns every tragedy into something beautiful. And for some of us, that's going to be really hard to hear. So I'm going to say it again. Because I know the stories in this room. God can turn every tragedy into something beautiful. God can turn every death, every affair, every overdose, every betrayal into something beautiful. But to do that, we have to be aware of these two perspectives. Is that one, God doesn't waste anything. He's not wasting your tears. He's not wasting your pain. He's not wasting your frustration. He's not wasting the, 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 night, the sleepless nights. He's not going to waste those things. And we have to be very aware of the second perspective in that there's eternity after this. Death is merely a comma. Eternity is the exclamation point. And so no matter what we face in this life, whether it be death, whether, whether it be betrayal, whether it be tears, that we know when we pass from this world to the next, when our, we are no longer present with our, with our earthly body, we are present with God. Amen. There is no more pain. There is no more suffering. There is no more tears. There is no more disease. There is no more cancer. There is no more uh, spousal betrayal. There is no more sickness. Come on. If we begin to have that, that perspective, 
You may have gotten a diagnosis this week that, that you have three months to live. And we can get bitter and we can get angry or we can realize, man, I've got three months and I'm off to heaven. I don't have to hurt anymore. Now, that, when, when we do see people move on, when we do see people, whether it's through death or through betrayal and they leave, we understand that we still hurt. We still miss that person. We still miss those memories and those relationships that we had. But what's amazing is God hurts too. Even with that perspective, he knows, God, why are you hurting? He doesn't, he doesn't judge you like that. He meets you and says that I hurt too. He mourns when we mourn. And he celebrates when we celebrate. So we could just hold on to that. Hold on to truth. Number two is practice thankful, thankfulness. Practice thankfulness. You cannot expect a positive outcome with a negative mind. It doesn't work. There's a reason why you're not supposed to play with battery acid. Did you know that, by the way? <laughs> you're not supposed to play with it. <laughs> you ever, like, left batteries in, like, a flashlight or, like, a toy uh, for, like, way too long, and you come back, and it's all corroded, and, like, it's, like, eating away the plastic and things like that? Yeah, don't put your finger in that. Uh, but that's what negativity does. It begins to erode and eat away at our hearts. And it, it, it tells bitterness. This is what bitterness is going to start saying. Oh, you're useless or worthless. You don't, you don't like it. See, negativity goes, keep going. You're right. Amen. That's that, the heckler in the crowd that's going, that's right. They don't like you. That's right. You can't trust them. They're like, they're like the hype guy to your bitterness. And so what happens, we continue this negative mindset, and your bitter heart always spills over into everything that you do. Have you ever ever seen, have you ever eaten something really bitter? I was trying to figure out, I was trying to find, like, what is something that is really bitter? So uh, Welcome Team's going to pass out sauerkraut to everybody. Um, We're all just going to all eat this together. No, we're not going to do that. Okay. Okay. My service producer is saying, no, we can't do that. Okay. Okay. Maybe next second service we'll make them eat sauerkraut. But whenever you eat something bitter, most, it's hard to find bitter things because no one likes to eat bitter things. It's gross. I was asking uh, Dom earlier, I'm like, what are some other bitter things? He's like, kale. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to force people to do that. That's gross. That's gross. But if you ever eat something bitter, you're like, like your whole face like crunches up. Like a lemon, it's like, ooh, sweet, but you kind of like it. Not bitter. It's just like, ooh. You get a nasty taste in your mouth. It's kind of gross. And that's really what happens when we allow that negativity and that bitterness to settle in our heart. You just start having a bitter face, Betty. It's just, and people know. People know, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to share with you. You're not going to celebrate with me. You're going to point out what's negative about what I, the, the joy and celebration I'm having. And this is why I think it's so important. How many of you in this room right now, you just want to know what God's will for your life is right now? You ready? You ready? You're going to find out right now. You're going to find out what God's will for your life is. You don't even have to come to church next week. If you master this, you don't have to go to church anymore. You ready? Give thanks in all circumstances. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. For this is God's will for you. <laughs> okay, so if you master that, you don't have to go to church anymore. Done? Deal? Oh, everyone's coming to church next week. That's what I'm hearing. Okay. Um, we have thankfulness. It's God's will. It's not like a positive, like, you know, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and gosh darn it, people like you. Help book. This is literally God's word saying, be thankful. It's my will. It's how God operates is to be thankful. And number three, surround yourself with humble people. If you're in a season of bitterness, you got to surround yourself with humble people, not proud people. They're just going to upset you more. You've got to have, have people around you that are going to stick with you even when you're not worth being stuck around with. Pride and neg- negativity will always cause more harm, and so you need someone who, who is, can stand with you, who you can harm them a little bit, and it's not going to affect them. This is why Ruth's role in Naomi's story is so important. 
says, no matter where you go. She even said, where, you know where you buried? That's where I'm going to be buried. I'm going to follow you to death. So no matter what you say or do or throw at me, if you, if you want to be Mara for the rest of your life, I am still sticking by you. A friend that sticks by you and the most difficult time is the one that's going to celebrate with you in the positive time. But the ones who just come in during the celebration, they're not going to stick around for the lament. They're not. And so we need to find people. And I'm not talking about you need 20 friends like Ruth. You just need one or two. And by the way, if you're someone's spouse in this room, you get to be their Ruth. And you may be the farthest thing from Ruth's character. Guess what? Start learning. Start walking humbly. Let go of pride. Let go of these things. Because what happens is when we begin to love one another unselfishly, we begin to, to identify with people where they're at in their pain instead of judging them for their pain. Because when you begin inviting negative people, they're just going to judge you like crazy. That's why relational boundaries are very important. I pointed this out a few weeks ago. Jesus loves everybody, but doesn't let everyone close to him when he was walking here on this earth. He even told the, the, the disciples this about the Pharisees. He says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. If you allow the, the, the spirit they were carrying is going to pour in your heart like leaven, it's going to start spreading everywhere. There's some people that you cannot let too close to your heart. And there's, you, but what happens is we get so jaded, we don't let anyone close to us. And so even if a Ruth came to us, we're like, Naomi, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. And for the most part, because we're not Ruth, we go, okay. But we need to begin to allow people like Ruth into our life, who can speak life, who can speak hope, who are going to stand with us no matter what the situation. And there's going to be some people in your life, you can love them, but it's time to set a boundary. Because bad character will always corrupt good company. Always. And there needs to be that degree of separation. I've even had to do that in my own life where there are friends who every single text, every single call, they're going to tell me about, it's just, they're just negative. They're going to complain about something or somebody. Or, and it's just like, okay, we're done here. There's a difference between uh, criticism and, and critique or criticism and tearing down. That's, yeah. So you can just like, people in your life just tear you down, tear you down. But then there's people who can critique you and it builds you up. Those are the people you want in your life, the ones who are going to build you up. So find that Ruth. Find someone who, you can, who can be humble with you. I'm going to invite our worship team forward. As we take a moment, as we worship, as we praise, as we have the prayer buckets, um, I can't tell you enough the, the, the effectiveness that these are carrying when we take the time to write out our prayer instead of it just being a thought. You know, begin to, to articulate the things that we're asking God to do asking the things that he wants you to change. Maybe you need to write on here is, is Lord, I, just, I, I, need, I need this root of bitterness taken out. And it's going to start at the way that we praise right now, the way that we're thankful. And when we do that, God's going to, God's going to come and he's going to teach you and, and remind you of the truth that he is always good and uses all things for his glory. So I want to invite us to stand. And as we worship and as we do our prayer and praise cards, there's going to be certain things that you need to go with Jesus to go to Jesus for, with, and so take the time to do that. This is why praise and worship is so important. This is how we fight our battles. This is how it becomes a weapon against the things of the enemy. Is sometimes praise and worship is going to be the thing that's going to be that that that, that garden tool that's going to start tearing out the the weeds and the the, the roots in your heart. So begin declaring His truth as we worship together.